Wireless Land Professionals podcast episode 181. We allow you to do it like in a scheduled basis. So you can say, okay, for speed test, I want to run maybe four times a day, uh, maybe a couple of times during business hours and a couple of times off hours to get some baseline there. Wireless Land Professionals is a place to educate, inform, encourage, and entertain those involved in wireless lands. This Wireless Land Professionals podcast is an audio manifestation of these goals. Our host is a wireless land veteran, consultant, designer, and teacher, Keith Parsons. And now, the podcast for wireless land professionals by wireless land professionals. Keith, we got another biggest struggle question for you. This comes from Daryl, and this is a question we get a lot, and it seems like a it is a common struggle. This uh, is, my biggest challenge is getting clarity on the requirements from the user. And um, I guess one of the questions I have kind of follow up, not to put words in Daryl's mouth, but a different angle, is there personality issues or soft skill things that maybe can help them in communication? Because I know you've answered this with, you know, how to think about Wi-Fi, what kind of questions and, and mindset you need. But what about those actual soft skills of being the kind of person who gets that from people? <laughs> what What would you tell someone in that kind of situation or how to develop that part of the asking piece of it? Uh, very good question. And thanks for asking it, Daryl. I, I, I think the soft skills side that you added to that, Matthew, is, is really important. Uh, so important that many uh, systems integrators and value-added resellers, instead of sending engineers out to collect these questions, they send out a salesperson with a a little punch sheet, a little list of questions. Mm. And the salesperson asks the questions because they're really good at that interface and talking. What the salespeople are not good at is pushing back to the customer. Now, engineers are a little anal at times, can mm -hmm. be, and not always good at the communication side. So I understand why a systems integrator would want to send a salesperson who's nice. But salesperson's favorite word is yes. When they ask a question, they love the customers to say yes. Do you, can I get a PO? Yes, that's what they want to hear. So when they're on the asking side, they like to get to yes. So they say something like, where do you need coverage? And the customer says, everywhere. And the salesman just checks and writes everywhere. everywhere. <laughs> Not knowing that you know, it, to add to stairwells and elevator shafts, you might add 40 to 50% of your additional cost. Now, they never stop and, and push back to the customer and say, are you sure you want to pay 50% more to add just stairwells and elevators? Uh, do you, you know, and, and they don't get to the details. Mm. And because they miss the details, later the engineer gets sent this uh, scope of work that says, we want coverage everywhere. And they have already said, well, we did some quick math, and so we divided the number of square feet by 2,500, and that's how many APs you have, and not knowing that 40% of those are going to just be in elevators and stairs. So I think maybe a good combination, if you're not the sales guy, but you're the engineer guy who's going to have to do it, is tag team when you go out on those sales calls. Learn from the salesman the techniques they use in asking the questions, but don't allow the salesperson to just roll over and play dead. When you have a serious piece of information you need to know, like how many clients do you have? What are the applications the clients are running? What type of clients do you have? What are you, your future going to be? Those all are very pertinent and will change the outcome of the design. So you can't allow them just to go, all clients, check. Yeah. We need, we need, we need to get down to the details. So maybe piggyback with the salesperson uh, or give you know, if you have a checklist that it means it looks like you're working for something organized that you're not just, you know, coming off the top of your head, I think you should do this. And you're saying, do you have, you know, have, have a process and the customers will probably like that process a little better. Not all customers like it though. Uh, I, I know a lot of customers just want to skip right to the end and say, well, just, just do it. And as an engineer, you have a little more tougher time. Do you have a document that you use or is it just so ingrained in your experience that you know what to ask based on the situation? Have you used a cheater sheet in the past? Do we have that on the site? I use, I use them all the time and they are not to be shared. Okay. <laughs> it's definitely, it's definitely very proprietary information. Okay. Uh, years ago, I went on a, on a, a quest to go and build the master sheet from everyone. And I talked to a whole bunch of people who have really good intake documents is what they call okay. them. Okay. 
And everyone said, not a chance. That's our secret sauce. That's how we make our money. So getting a hold of one, there's some generic ones. If you get in the back of the CWNA or CWDP manuals, there's some generic ones. But building that list and the the, the problem with my, my list currently is 24 pages long. And, yeah. and single spaced. So it's got the the issue is when I sit down with a customer, I use it as a checklist, but uh, either before or sometimes when I'm even live there, you have to adjust the list. If the, yeah. you know there's a whole section on voice, and if they say we don't need voice, then I can skip that. Or on the section on voice, they say we need voice, but we're installing a Cisco handset. Well, then there's a whole bunch of things about Ascom and Avaya and the other vendors that I don't have to ask. So yes, I have a very, very detailed list, but then the, the use of it is paring down to ask only the questions that are important for that customer. So it sounds like a, a good goal for maybe Daryl or anyone in the situation is spend time, maybe you and the sales team and create the intake document that makes sense for both parties. And, and just make sure that you don't, as an engineer, if you it just let's just back up for a second. If you're yeah. an engineer and you went to a customer and you were a structural engineer, you're building, you're trying to design the beams that go over and hold the roof up. If you went in and you ask a simple question like, uh, "How many floors is the building?" and they went, "Oh no, just design each floor. We don't know if it's going to be a five-story building or a seven-story building." It's really important. <laughs> Now, you could over-engineer and put huge ones saying, maybe it's going to be a 20-story building, maybe it's only going to be a 10. Now, I've been in places in the world where they build a two-story building, and then you see on the roof, all of the rebar is poking up, so they designed it to add another Mm -hmm. floor on top when they get enough cash. They don't have enough cash, so they only built a two-story building, but they designed it for a three or a four. Uh We need to ask those questions. You would never allow a structural engineer to get away with, I don't know how many floors it is, but somehow our customers want us to get away with, oh, well, I don't know what the Wi-Fi clients are, any client. So I I think if we give them some examples of other engineering issues that they've already do, kind of like, and this is kind of an aside, but uh, some of our customers are like, well, I don't want to pay for design. And you're like, so the architect who designed your building, you didn't pay him? Paying for design is a thing. We do it everywhere. Yep. And then we get someplace into wireless and, the, and some installer or some uh, salesperson says, oh, no, we'll design it for free. Uh, I, I admit, sometimes I do designs for free, but that's only for the people who buy the hardware from me. Yeah, yeah. If they don't buy the hardware, you got to pay for the design. WLAN Interview. Welcome. Keith Parsons here with Wireless LAN Professionals Podcast. And today I have with me Panos Vuzis. I think I got that right. How are you doing today, Panos? Great. Hi, Keith. Thanks for having me. You got it right. I got it right. Yes. Uh, hey, I, I've been to Greece once and didn't learn any Greek at all. So, <laughs> but, but I at least got your name right. So, uh, let's get started. You're with NetBees. NetBees has been in the in the I don't even what you put the category in babysitting and managing and monitoring Wi-Fi for a long time, uh, and you have some new stuff out. So I thought we'd get you uh, on the podcast and talk a little bit about your uh, 1.5 release and, uh, and hear, hear about all the new stuff you've got going in at Bees. And, and also, I wanted to congratulate on some of the things you've been posting lately that I liked. So are you good with that? Great. Of course. Let's get going. I, uh, I just wanted to congratulate you or thank you or give you kudos. I think your, your series that you've been posting lately on uh, Linux steps for the wireless professional have been a a great resource i save them i capture them uh print them out and i have them on my ipad so i I think that's a great resource for everyone what what was your idea about about starting that whole series definitely yeah uh it's been a very successful series of blog posts uh we've been very active uh in blogging in general uh since we launched our you know like endeavor here and um, the, the thing is that, you know, in our product uh, itself, uh, we use lots of open source software. And of course, Linux is the base of our, you know, like uh, product for everything now, right? The, the sensors and um, uh, the server we're using. And of course, uh, we develop a lot in Linux and a lot allowed around doing networking stuff on Linux, right? Uh, we have to manipulate interfaces, uh, do routing on the on the Linux on Linux box, um, do 
uh, Wi-Fi surveys and scans. And of course, um, I realized at some point I learned so many things during this process myself. And uh, it really I would like to, to share it with the community. Um, so I try to, uh, it, it's, it's every other week, actually. I take turns with my uh, co-founder in blogging. Every other week, I try to put out a, a blog post um, around Linux for network engineers. Um, and um, I deal with things like how to configure um, things like a DNS server, how to um, you know, like manipulate the interface and some more advanced stuff like uh, to write even the bash script, right? To use people to automation uh, and uh, get their hands dirty with some programming. Uh, and it was my pleasure actually to present at the WLPC um, this year, uh, like an introduction of how people can get uh, into Linux, right? Uh, of course, I wasn't expecting 20 minutes to teach Linux to anybody, but I just want to give some pointers and people can follow up on our blog post and learn uh, gradually uh, things around Linux networking and Wi-Fi as well. We'll have links over to your uh, blog from uh, the podcast, but uh, highly recommend anyone who wants to learn a little bit or even just uh, play with it, uh, go over to the blog that Panos has done. Um, and and you can, you can, you know, start easy and learn as much as you want about how uh, Linux works. But kudos that you took with the things you learned um, in, in developing your product and sharing it with the community. That was, that's well done. Well, let's, let's talk about your, your hardware. You had hardware running on like a little uh, Raspberry Pi for a long time, but you now have some uh, new versions. Tell us about the, the different sensors that are available from NetBees. Definitely, yes. Um, and I can go a little bit back here now, uh, take a step back. Uh, uh, when we started NetBees, actually, our co-founder, Stefano, was... Uh, network engineer. He wasn't really a Wi-Fi engineer. So our first uh, sensor was a wired sensor, right? And of course, when we showed that to customers, to, to first beta users, they were asking about, hey, okay, that's great, but let's do the same on Wi-Fi. So we realized there was a big opportunity there and we jumped into that, uh, you know, like uh, space. Um, so from the very beginning, we have used, um, uh, first our first platform actually was uh, the Raspberry Pi platform. Um, many people are familiar with that. Um, very versatile and, and low cost, actually, right? Um, hardware to, that runs Linux. So that's where this comes in, right? So it's a Linux box that you can do so many different things with, right? Um, and you know that very well. And the community has endorsed and they used a lot the, the NanoPy, um, which is a similar platform. Um, so we use the Raspberry Pi uh, as uh, a sensor um, for uh, for Wi-Fi. We use uh, some extensions and some other hardware to make it um, 11 ac 2x2. Two two. Um, and uh, but also uh, we haven't forgotten our I guess our roots. We have both wired and Wi-Fi sensors. Uh, so for Wi-Fi sensors, we use another platform um, which. Uh, is also off the shelf, uh, runs Linux, um, and um, the, actually it's an interesting platform because it uh, it's an x86 single board computer, um, and I'm mentioning this because most of these, uh, for example, the NanoPi or the Raspberry Pi, are ARM-based computers um, with the x86. Um, you get some additional benefits in terms of uh, uh, what uh, Linux distributions you can use, and uh, I would say a little bit more uh, support, better support in um, in updates and uh, new distributions. Uh, so, but uh, yeah, I mean, uh, it's been a great platform, and we we'll keep evolving, exploring the community, and looking actually at new hardware right now that we may release in the next couple of months. So, do you have to keep uh, different um, code bases? that run the NetBees sensing app, uh, depending on the platform? Or is it you have one consistent uh, code base? So uh, the code base is the same. Um, we, you know, we develop in a way that we can support different uh, the different platforms, uh, our software. Uh, so the code base is the same, but with some modifications, of course, to make sure that it's compatible with the different versions. Um, however, we also have... Um, just an example, right? Uh, we also have uh, out like a Debian package that 
customers or people that want to try our product, they can use and install it even on their own hardware, right? If they have, um, let's say, um, an Ubuntu server or uh, their own Raspberry Pi, they can just download our Debian package. And of course, that supports the different architectures, um, ARM, 64, 32, uh, AMD, like you know, x86, I would say, uh, 64 bits, right? Uh, so we make all those available. And um, and for our production, of course, we prepackage everything, but also we have you know the option for users to use our open source uh, and free um, uh, software if they want. So if you're uh, open source and you allow that free software, what's your business model? How does NetBees, uh, how, you know, how do you how do you earn a living there? Yeah, yeah, definitely. I mean, um, the the value we add mostly is, um, of course, the sensor is, is a, the essential part of the product that you need to, uh, you know, monitor place at the different Wi-Fi locations and monitor the, the user experience. But most of the value is derived actually from the, from dashboard, right? So um, all this data that you collect from the different sensors on your network. Um, are um, being collected on our dashboard. Uh, it can be uh, on the cloud or it can be uh, on premise, and um, uh, that's where all the I would say magic happens, right? All the data is collected, uh, statistics are being um, calculated, uh, all the user management uh, that um, to manage their fleet and the swarm of, of bees, right? To perform the necessary tasks and monitoring they, they want to, to, to do on their network. Okay. You just got me now. This is the, I am totally admitting this. This is the first time I got bees when you said swarm. <laughs> cool. I, I'm, I'm really slow. I didn't see any, any little bee logos on your webpage or anything. So I've, I've just thought it was a, <laughs> a bees. Okay. Got, you got me now. So if you were a end customer and you wanted to put these sensors around in your network, what's, the kind of pricing model that you'd be looking at, both the cost of the sensor, but also the cost of the dashboard. Right. So um, the, the pricing is based on the number of of, uh, of sensors you get. Um, the um, uh, to give you an idea, I mean the starting price uh, you gotta get a minimum package of, of five of five agents is um, thirty six hundred dollars per per year. Um, that's for five. You get the, the hardware, so the hardware is included in the subscription. And it also includes uh, the server and the dashboard, right? Um, so um, now, of course, there's, of course, um, if you go to larger number of, of agents and most of our customers are, you know, like medium to large corporations, that's when the need for NetBees comes in, right? When they have multiple locations, dozens or even hundreds of locations that they have remote workers, they don't have local IT to help them support the problems through Wi-Fi and wired networks, right? Um that's when you know you can uh, install dozens or hundreds of these uh, device, the sensors, to uh, get a f like complete perspective of your Wi-Fi network. Um, you can do monitoring, alerting, baselining, and um, be able to be on top of things uh, before your users complain. Um, so, of course, there the pricing is, is different, uh, and it scales based on the number of, of agents in a way that makes it uh, affordable. And without breaking the bank, right, to install even hundreds of these sensors uh, without having to, you know, like uh, pay a, 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 an arm, right? So if you're wanting to watch your Wi-Fi and you put in one of the sensors, one of the questions we get with any kind of overlay system is what's the ratio of sensors to access points? You know, I know it's not an easy question, but we get it all the time. So is, Yeah, um, also our, our customers ask us about that and... Um, <laughs> Like, you know, uh, like the answer, it's so many in life, right? Uh, it, it depends, right? Um, the, the, the biggest, I would say, the first uh, starting point is uh, we work with the customer is that you um, you need one per location at least, right? So, of course, that's if you want to monitor a specific location, you need one sensor there. Um, now, the, um, we have, again, let me go back a little bit. Um, on the wired side, usually you want to have the perspective of both, right? Uh, if you want to make sure that a problem comes on the Wi-Fi side, on the wire side, if it's a backhaul, backhaul problem, it's advisable to have also a wired agent at its, at its location. So one wired agent at the, at the core router is probably enough in that case. 
Uh, some people want to go more fine, more granular. They go one per IDF, for example, right? But uh, depends, you know, how granular you want to be, right? Now, on the wireless side, things are a little bit more, of course, uh, vague. We start with the um, with the um, advice to to think about your uh, high concentration areas first and the high value areas. So the boardroom, the C-suite, right? Uh, a big auditorium. Um, probably are locations where you want to install at least one agent uh, to make sure that you know you you cover a big chunk of your users. So that's one thing. And then the other thing is that problematic areas. So if you know you have specific locations where you might have interference, you might have um, uh, many complaints from users, and you're going to keep an eye on them, then uh, that's another location where you can uh, install uh, an agent there to make sure that uh, you have that perspective on your dashboard. Um, so these are, I would say, the, the general high-level rule of thumb that we um, go with with our customers when we do our solution planning. Um, and uh, and then, of course, um, the more granular you want to go, um, it, it's easy. Uh, the solution is scalable. Um, the backend is scalable. You can add agents depending on uh, uh, how important your infrastructure is uh, and of course uh, how um, how well you want to monitor your network so if I've uh, got a net B solution in let's say my hospital and I uh, you know take my MDF as one each of my IDFs have one from the wired side I spread them out maybe one every 10 APs just so I have a, a, a tendency there the reporting that comes off of that how how did you get actionable items from there so uh, you're not going to be able to tell if I have coverage, but you'll be able to tell if systems go down. So what's the actionable items that come off your reporting? So the data we collect give you the ability to uh, monitor user experience, right? So you, um, of course, again, as a hospital, let's say, um, you have certain specific applications, let's say, uh, and resources that all your nurses um Doctors, but also also guests want to use, right? The guests want to use the internet and uh, all the uh, entertaining stuff and patients, and then your employees want to use all the internal um, application resources, right? Even voice, VoIP, right? Over is is important, um, an important resource on, on hospitals. Um, so you're gonna uh, make sure that your sensors uh, simulate user experience and. Um, monitor and check continuously the same resource, the same applications that your uh, users need to use and uh, make sure that um, you put, for example, of course, how where, how quickly you want to get notified when something goes wrong, right? Of course, some intermittent issues may be acceptable in some locations or some applications, but some may not be. And um, the simplest thing we can do, of course, is to send you an alert when you, let's say, you have a performance degradation. If your response time to specific critical application um, increased by a certain threshold, let's say, goes above two seconds, let's say, right, or uh, drops completely, right, uh, then uh, the simplest thing you can do is you receive an alert, notify your um, your uh, NOC center, your network engineers, uh, through many different ways, actually, right? It can be email is the simplest. Um, you can integrate it with other things like PagerDuty, um, Splunk, or even Slack, right? So now Slack is everywhere. Uh, if your NOC team is on Slack, you can send your alerts on Slack and you can uh, even um, get them there so that the whole team can see them and discuss around them. And going a little bit more advanced, Apart from a simple alert, we have what we call incidents where you can set um, certain thresholds in the sense that, um, let's say, if I lose 80% uh, of my applications, right, or even 10% of my applications are not responding or have low performance, then I want to receive an alert. So that filters down a little bit, I would say, the number of notifications you may get. Of course, we know everybody knows about the alert fatigue. <laughs> everybody has now a number of monitoring tools in their arsenal and they're receiving alerts from everywhere. So the, the incidents we have, the incidents mechanism, allows you to filter down a little bit the um, alerts you get and uh, customize them to your needs, actually. 
Well, let's let's um, move on more to the the business side of NetBees. Uh, the technical side kind of makes sense. People understand uh, you're you're running some level of synthetic testing to test VoIP or speed test or iPerf, and then you can report on them. If you were uh, going into a new customer, and since we have uh, thousands of people are downloading these podcasts, you have some potential customers to talk to. How would you sell? Uh, a NetB solution compared to your competitors. Competitors being no sensors, just using what's inside your controller versus, uh, you know, your competitors who have sensor networks, uh, Ybot, Cape, or 7Signal kind of thing. How do you go about saying why NetBees is better? Give me your sales pitch. The first thing you have to think about is um, we give you the ability to cover both your wired and wireless network. Uh, so we have both types of sensors, and not only that, we have uh, virtual sensors. Um, now we just released actually our um, Docker sensor and also uh, cloud sensors. So especially with the Docker sensor, what you can do right now, of course, you know, Docker is exploding. You can install quite easily, actually, a, a sensor on, on a user's laptop, right? Um, of course, we have the hardware piece, but... Sometimes when you get that when you get that perspective per user experience uh, with a Docker sensor, you can um, get somebody's laptop um, and um, spin up a sensor, right? Just just a, a technical question to insert there. If I'm running Docker, let's say I'm on a MacBook, uh, is it using the MacBook's internal Wi-Fi and reporting back what it sees? Uh, so for for the docker now we just released it it doesn't uh, capture the the wi-fi metrics it doesn't capture things like like we do with the hardware sensors like uh, signal strength or uh, you know link quality but it gives you the user experience in the sense that you can do the application verification you can do um for example uh you can do a speed test right to see what performance you get right uh, in a future release, we'll be able to capture all these metrics as well from the Docker container and present you the Wi-Fi um, visibility of what you see on your Mac or your Windows uh, machine. Okay. Uh, yeah. So continue. Yeah. So we have this, this complete picture where you can install these different sensors on every edge of your network, right? Wired, uh, wireless, end user device, uh, cloud or, or virtual. Um Actually, right now, in the we're going to Cisco Live uh, next month, and we're having a joint session where we're also talking about how to install an agent on the Cat9000 Cisco um, uh, switch and uh, you know infrastructure now, uh, and the whole DNA thing they're uh, promoting. Uh, so we'll give you the complete picture of what's going on in your network. You can co- cover every edge and every every corner. Now the solution we have for the Server specifically, uh, we offer both an on-premise and a cloud dashboard. Uh, we still have many customers that are very uh, security um, aware, right? And they have very critical applications, um, and um, uh, they most of them prefer to go with the on-prem solution because they still, you know, are not fully cloud. I would say um, uh, uh, cloud-enabled, right? Uh, they have still restrictions because of compliance issues and all these things. And uh, so, with that, with all that infrastructure we we support, we um, we have the ability to give you a complete picture. And also, having this software version of the agent will give you will give you the ability to scale that to hundreds or even you know like um, even thousands of agents if, if needed, right? Um, in a software basis, which makes the solution uh, affordable and scalable from a pricing perspective. Uh, not not hardware is not necessarily always um, need it if you want to go, if you can, can solve your problem with a software agent, let's say. Um, so one of, one of the questions is, is there a way to um, set up the synthetic testing timing? If we're running iPerfs or VoIP testing, uh, we don't want to load up the network excessively, but we'd like to know how it's going. What's the, the control you have over the timing of those synthetic tests? Uh, yeah, especially with the test you just mentioned, maybe hyperf and speed test especially, right? Where you really stress your network. You want to be a little bit careful. You don't want to run an hyperf or, or a speed test uh, every minute, right? Of, on a network and then defeat the purpose of monitoring. Uh, um, so, yes. Uh, so, we give you, um, first of all, we make sure we have an, a mechanism that uh, we make sure that you don't run more than one of these 
especially high performance speed tests and that are high uh, demanding tests uh, per per agent, right? So we have a blocking mechanism that you can run only one per device at any given time, right? So you cannot really even accidentally flood your network and, and break things. Um, and then um, we um, we allow you to do it like in a scheduled basis. So you can say, okay, for speed test, I want to run maybe four times a day, uh, maybe a couple of times during business hours and a couple of times off hours to get some baseline there. Um, and um, while with the other tests, the uh, like latency test, uh, HTTP test or DNS test, uh, you can run them much more often. Actually, most of our customers run them like every few seconds or a, or a minute. Uh, because okay, doing like um, a DNS uh, query, it doesn't really shouldn't be like uh, an issue right on your network. They put any stress on it. Those are okay to run them quite often, actually. But yeah, I mean, as you mentioned, um, we uh, have mechanisms that give you the ability to schedule them in a like I would say a spaced time spaced um, fashion, and also we don't allow you to break your network accidentally. <laughs> well, that that's nice that you're being protective. Um, on on configuring the Wi-Fi side, uh, obviously the the sensors need to connect and connect up. Do you support uh, WPA one, two, three, uh, and how do you go about choosing what EAP methods so that your clients can act, your sensors can act like our clients? The um, all the agents are managed from the dashboards. So all the configuration of the credentials for the agents are managed from from the dashboard. So at least the first time you connect them, a Wi-Fi sensor, you have to connect it to um, to a drop so it can connect the dashboard, right? Then from there, you can plug, you can connect on it and configure its credentials. Yeah, you can support dot one x of course. And um, all the different methods that are, you know, available are, uh, that are, you know, are on our dashboard. So you can choose them from a menu, uh, upload your credentials, uh, keys, certificates, and then everything is... Uh, automatically, uh, you know, like assigned to the agent so they can connect to the right network. Um, so um, that's how you configure them. Um, and we also now recently, actually in version 1.5, we introduced the option to multiple to monitor multiple SIDs. Uh, what that means is that when you have an agent, of course, as a client on your network, um, and uh, you want to you have more than one side this at least you know right now you're going to have two or three in any enterprises enterprise you're going to have uh, you know, guest network and then your internal corporate wi-fi networks we give you the ability to do what we call SID hopping so you're able to configure different profiles for each uh, SID let's say if you have an, an open guest um, network then you can configure one profile according to that. If you have your internal WPA2, et cetera, um, profiles, you can configure them again. And then you can tell the agent, hey, I want you to monitor for five minutes my guest network, another five my guest network, and another five minutes my uh, internal corporate network, for example. Uh, so you can do all this from the dashboard, of course, and uh, without having to touch the agents, uh, obviously. Uh, one of the, you mentioned guest network. Do you have the ability for your sensors to join a guest network with a captive portal and get past the captive portal? Right now, we don't have this ability. You have to um, whitelist your sensors from uh, from your controller, let's say. Uh, but it's something that is coming up in our next uh, next couple of releases, actually. Well, Panos, I appreciate your time today, sharing us a little bit about uh, where NetBees was and where it's going, and and what you're doing with it today. Um, if someone wants to get a hold of you or NetBees, where would they track you down? Yeah, thank you for having me, Keith. Uh, yeah, so uh, you can find us at uh, netbees.net. Um, so uh, there you can learn about our product. Um, you can also, uh, as Keith mentioned, we have a, a very active um, blog there. Uh, we talk about uh, Wi-Fi issues. We try to uh, share the what we learn at work. And... Um, we're also going to Cisco Live next month. Uh, if any uh, folks are there, we're going to be at booth 3234. Um, come stop by, say hi, and we can chat. Great. I appreciate that. We'll put links in the show notes to your site. And uh, especially, I want to re re renew my gratefulness that you've uh, started putting your, your blog posts, sharing what you've learned out with the 
things. And I just noticed you even have a how to install the NetBees Docker agent on a MacBook. I, I think I have something to do this weekend. You got it. So thanks again for your time. And uh, we'll see you on the web. Hopefully we'll see you at the WPC as well. Of course. Thank you. Have a good one. I'll be there. 10 Talks. How's everybody doing? Mike Albano. Um, there's my email, Twitter, what have you. I'm just going to jump right in. I work for Google. I'm on the enterprise side of the house. Um, so we handle the um, deploying and monitoring the network for Googlers. Um, so here's the agenda for the next 10 minutes. I'm just going to go into how we used to do it, um, disadvantages of that, what lessons learned, what have you, and how we do it now. And the goal is that he would agree that how we do it now is better, but we'll see. All right, so very loose dress code at Google. Uh, all you have to do is wear something, so I got away looking like this seven years ago. Um, so yes, it was build rooms, documents with standard configurations. It was entirely CLI driven. Um, we had a lot of employees that all had access to the infrastructure. Uh, to do the, both the deployment and the monitoring. We were using vendor NMSs, such as Prime and AMP, to monitor the network. And um, we had a sort of host of other tooling that we used as well. Um, open source tooling, Rancid, um, Nagios, what have you. I'm sure many people in the room have experience with that stuff. Um, and it was pretty much dynamic everything. Um, no automation, we deployed a vendor. All right, so then a couple years later, um, we got rid of the documents and we started using config generators to try and come up with a little bit more predictable way of generating this configuration so that we could have, you know, the goal was obviously having the same configuration on a lot of different devices. Um, got rid of the vendor NMSs and we were starting to experiment with graphing the telemetry ourselves, the radio data, the stuff that we all need and use to monitor the network. Um, how are we doing that? The same way everybody else, SNMP, and a lot of scripts, <laughs> a lot of CLI screen scraping, having, having scripts that log in, do some show commands, stick it in, in a database, um, a lot of scripts. Um, moved on to static transit powers, we're still doing dynamic channels. Uh, the, the goal there was uh, we weren't ready to approach static channels, but we absolutely wanted to control the size of our cells since that's what we designed the network for. Um, still deployed a vendor and still relatively little automation, just some. I mean, kind of depends. Automation is a very broad term. We were using config generators, so you could say that was automation. Um, all right, so there was a lot of problems with this. Um, it was a highly distributed network, a lot of buildings, global, blah, 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 scale. Um, a lot of the problems were caused by us, the humans. There's a lot of outages caused by just having such a distributed model of all of these systems and everybody had access to it. And it wasn't, there was never any nefarious activity going on. It was just that, uh, you know, people make mistakes or they think they're helping and, and they're hurting in other ways. So yeah, it was problematic. It was kind of the, the Wild West. Um, so what did we want to change? Um, I should say that you know, no human was fired during this transition from when we went from one doing it one way to another. Um, so this is kind of in jest. But we sort of stepped back and said, all right, like here's the lofty goals that we want to solve. What, what are all these problems of doing networking the way that we have been doing it for so long? How could we do it differently? What would we fix? What, what, what do we want to tackle now? So, all right, so one, we know we needed radio data. We know we needed telemetry uh, and we needed it fast. So SNMP wasn't working. Um, you take uh, any, a, a lot of data, like whether it's data to 11 retries, channel utilization, what have you, you aggregate that out to 15 minutes and it becomes absolutely worthless. Um, you, you mask the spikes, you can't see what's actually occurring in the network. If it was a problem for one minute and then great for 14, then you don't know what happened. Um, so we need radio data, we need it fast. Um, we needed freedom of choice, so we wanted a multi-vendor network. We wanted this, the, the ability to do what we had heard about, which was align a vendor to a use case, whether it's 
through uh, you know, some software or hardware differentiation. We wanted the ability to choose a vendor um, based on our needs, but we couldn't do that, not, not at this scale, uh, not without translation layers. So real quick, translation layers is basically taking a proprietary MIB or a proprietary CLI interface and then translating that to something um, neutral on the back end. But that's, that, those translation layers are something we had to maintain, and that was problematic. Um, we wanted APIs for everything. So we no longer wanted SNMP. We no longer wanted to be doing scripts and screen scraping and all that stuff. We wanted everything to be programmatic so we could um, automate it and be more predictable. Uh, that's the fourth one, absolute predictable configuration. Just because we think we configured something one way, we needed to know with 100% assurance that it was still configured that way, and there's many reasons for that config to drift. Um, so that, those were the goals. Uh, there are always humans. We, so we, we figured, okay, if we're gonna go down this path of automating everything, um, what should we not automate? And the design was a, a sort of a, a clear one that you wouldn't automate, right? We're always gonna have humans generating those heat maps, um, figuring out where the APs need to place, be placed. Dots on a floor plan, channel, transit power, typical wireless LAN design stuff, right, that, that, that we all do. Um, so what we thought we'd do is treat this heat map as the one true authoritative source for everything. Um, so the heat map is, is the only thing that humans touch. In fact, that's how we got to here, which is basically the, the only way we deploy networks now is that we have the heat map, which a human generates, and that is it. Um, everything else is automated through APIs. So we used slides just because we needed, so we, we just needed something that we could stick a floor plan on, put some dots on it, and you know, a, a label for the typical five layer stuff, you know, channel, channel width, transit power. So we use slides because it has an API and we could feed back into that. So we access the API, we get our AP name, we get all our five layer stuff. Um, and then when we, we do our channel planning, using neighbor tables, again, telemetry, RSSI neighbor tables, we, we come up with a quick channel plan, and then we do puts back into that same API to, so that the heat map gets updated with what channels we've selected, the five layer stuff that we've selected. So what this means is the network gets deployed without a single human logging into anything. No logging into a CLI, no SNMP writes. It's basically a script that gets run after the things are physically mounted. Nobody, nobody logs into anything. And on the operation side, when we're monitoring it, nobody's logging in to anything. It's all um, abstracted by the uh, operations staff. And that was important for us. We couldn't retrain our NOC and our operations and our engineers for every vendor's interface. Um, so I'm gonna race through this. Obviously, I'm here to talk to people, so please come up and shoot holes in my theories and ask me more questions about how I do this after. So yeah, we monitor stuff in a vendor neutral way. We've got graphs. Um, but you know, we're, we're accessing, accessing the, the APs programmatically, getting, getting the telemetry we need, populating a graph, and this is the same amongst all vendors. So we deploy multiple vendors without our NOC or our operations staff even knowing which vendor is on the ceiling. Nobody knows. Um, that's sort of the, the mantra there, um, and that's the way we truly reach this multi-vendor environment, both deploy and operations. Unless it gets escalated, unless it's a vendor-specific software bug, they never know which vendor is getting deployed. All right, so what does this get us? Um, well, pretty much gets us to those high-level lofty goals we wanted. Um, so the way we do that is uh, I sat on this stage like two years ago and I was presenting on this thing called Open Config, which is, you know, the, the short version of that is it's a bunch of network engineers that get together and decide what a schema should look like, what the API should look like to, a, to network elements. Uh, and two years ago, it was just a theory. Um, I was sort of saying, hey, do you guys think this is a good idea? Then I went and talked to a bunch of people, some of them in this room, came up with these Yang models, um, which is the modeling language we use to define these APIs. And now it's a thing and multiple vendors are supporting it and we use it to deploy our networks. So that's how we got the multi-vendor aspect. Um, and uh, you know, there's some data points there about you know, how much better it is now. And it's uh, obviously a lot faster to, to deploy easier to monitor, no build rooms, no docs. Uh, we use zero vendor proprietary tools. Um, and that's, uh, that's pretty much about it. We have an app that, we, that helps us with scanning of MAC addresses for mounting. A lot of people have done that. Um, that's pretty much it.
Yes, it is a Wi-Fi conference, so I like throwing out argumentative statements like static everything everywhere all the time is better always. Um, <laughs> we found it way more predictable and a lot easier to uh, operate the network. Thank you for joining us for another episode of the Wireless Land Professionals Podcast. The podcast for wireless land professionals by wireless land professionals. Be sure to follow us on Twitter at Wireless Land Pros for all the latest news and updates. And also connect directly with Keith on Twitter at Keith R. Parsons. Head over to www.wlandpros.com for this episode's show notes, as well as the latest in all things Wi-Fi.